Come on, son, son, son. son. <laughs> Grab the yams on the track. <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Ed Lover. It's time for another Come On, Said, the podcast. How's everybody doing? As usual, I'm good. As usual, y'all know how I get down when I do these podcasts. Y'all know that my podcasts are always brought to you by CigarsInternational.com. I uh, smoked a very beautiful Avo Nicaraguan box press the other night. One of my favorite cigars of all time. Thank you, CigarsInternational.com, for your continued support of my podcast. And thanks to everybody out there that uh, listens to the podcast. It is really greatly appreciated that you take the time out and listen. Go to CigarsInternational.com once again for all your cigar needs. Big shout out to Brothers of the Leaf. Uh, those are my guys, DP, uh, Don Payne, and all my fellows at Marshall and, and Cigar Monocle and everybody that, that follows my podcast, my man Kev Richburg, Marv Richburg, Kurt Flirt, Dita God, all my boys that, that follow the podcast. Uh, also, my smoking fellas out there, Smoke Fellas of Chicago, big shout out to y'all, Damani and the whole crew, the Diva Leaf crew, big shout out to y'all, Those that's the ladies. That smoke. That's the ladies, Keisha, Jatan, Nia, the whole crew, um, out of Chicago. That smoke. My man Stevie B, my man OT, my man Jamie for the hookup on the sticks, but my man Fire Marshall West from CigarsInternational.com, who really helped me put my whole my whole thing in motion as far as dealing with CigarsInternational.com. My brothers in Atlanta, everybody from Six One Seven, everybody to. You know, my, my League of Distinguished Gentlemen, family, Phil, Reggie, Pat, Tracy, all of you, my brother, Spencer, uh, Big Tyrone Hill, everybody that I smoke, everybody from Cigar City, um, everybody from Cigar Rose, all my smoking people that I've met over the years that truly 100% wholeheartedly support what I'm doing with this podcast and my cigar life. Because there is a secret society of cigar smokers out there. My man Wilbur Melhouse, big shout out to you. Dawn Melhouse, shout out to you. Biggs Mansion in Chicago, shout out to you. These people support everything that I do, and they make my dreams come true, and they help me keep feeding my family. I still got uh, my daughter Summer in college, and uh, they keep me afloat, man. And without people like you that just listen and people like you that like you, excuse me, that encourage me all the time to keep moving forward. I mean, I couldn't be I couldn't do this podcast. I couldn't do this podcast at all. Combat Jack, rest in peace. A hey, King, how you doing, brother? The Loudspeaker Network family, how's everybody doing? Hope everybody's fine. Hope everybody's healthy. Hope everybody's doing well. Really, I really do hope everybody is doing well. Of course, my executive producer, Kimana Paulus, producer, super producer, Krista Hayes, who always puts everything together. I call her Baby Bucket. Um, She always does a fantastic job, Baby Bucket, when it comes to uh, putting these podcasts together and making sure that I'm on point. And even in the times that I don't want to do a podcast, she always makes sure, Ed, don't forget you got to do a podcast. Ed, don't forget you got a podcast. Sometimes it's really, really difficult to podcast. Like, people say, yo, how do you get into the podcast? And I tell them, I said, listen, just do it. Like, there's no right or wrong way to tell you to do it, but I'll tell you what Combat Jack told me. Consistency is the key. People look for it. The internets love it. And the internet's look forward to listening to what you have to say. So you have to be consistent. And one thing that I've learned in this podcast world is it's not always all about what celebrity you can drag in. Matter of fact, half the time it's not at all. Well, I would actually say 60% of the time it's not about what celebrity you can get. There's a lot of people out there that podcast 
a lot of different podcasts and I take my hat off to each and every one of you that's that's podcasting or trying to podcast or get a podcast off the ground I take my hat off to you because it's not an easy thing to do and to be entertaining at it shit and I love having guests because guests really for me helps the time go by a lot faster but sometimes for me and I notice with with my analytics of my podcast I can pick exactly like who supports like which cities support the most which cities I have the best listenership in which podcasts get the most um, has the most reach or have the most the most ears on it and a lot of times it is not my podcast with guests like I think hey man I'm gonna get this person I'm gonna get that person I'm gonna sit down with them and we're gonna talk for like an hour hour and a half maybe maybe even 40 minutes I don't know however long the podcast lasts um and I'll be like yo that was a great podcast when that comes out I know everybody's gonna listen to it and sometimes they don't sometimes people just be like "Ah, I'm not really interested in that person but I find that when I'm by myself, like I am right now, and our podcast is just me talking about what's on my mind, the things that I see, I get more ears on it. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know why, but it seems like people, you know, have responded in kind. I've, I've gotten a lot, 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 or shitload, for lack of a better term, of responses to podcast about suicide, podcasts about health, podcasts about love. I get all of those responses when I do that, those kind of immediate responses about, oh, wow, I listened to that and that helped me realize this, or I listened to that and I didn't know this, or I listened to that and I didn't know that. Um, you know, those kind of responses I get when I podcast by myself in comparison to podcasting with somebody else. Unless, of course, we're talking about mental health or I have a doctor on or 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 somebody that's been through something serious in their life or an author about a self-help book. Those kind of things, I get a lot of great responses out of them. And there's a lot of things that go on that or have gone on with me in my entire life. When I was 18 years old, um my dad passed away and for a kid that was lucky enough to grow up with his dad in the house all of my life even through the struggle times of our lives my dad was always there for me to lose my dad at 18 years old was quite traumatic for me it was quite devastating to me My sister is two years younger than me. I never realized how much losing our dad affected her. My brother is three years older than me, the next in line. Thomas, we call him Larry. Don't ask me why him and I are the only ones that go by our middle names in the house. But he's three years older and Kelvin's five years older. So they're pretty much on their way to doing whatever they decided to do in their lives but I was 18 and my sister was 16 and it really had a profound effect on me and not in a negative way because my dad always saying, said to me taking death and using it as an excuse to do wrong is a coward's way out that's, that's one thing that I always learned from my, from my dad one of multiple multiple things that I learned from my dad but he always said that that's a coward's way out like you don't self-medicate yourself with drugs and alcohol because somebody dies that's not going to bring them back and it's only going to do you harm you have to use what you learn from people's death as a strength to keep going and to move on my grandmother was still alive when my father passed away I, I cannot even begin to imagine what pain she must felt from losing a child. I can only imagine if anybody out there listening that lost a child before, you know, you think you're going to pass before your children pass and you hope that you pass 
before your children pass. That's a lot of pain right there, but you don't want to be alive and lose a child. Anybody out there that has a family member or has had lost a child themselves, I feel for you. It is, God, I can't imagine what my grandmother was going through because I was going through it. I can't imagine what my mom was going through because I was going through it. My own type of grieving. Um, my daughter Tiffany, her mom lost her son, Kepler, to gun violence. And she's not absolutely not the same person. Um, she never will be again, and I can't blame her. I can't imagine. My daughter lost her brother. Um, I can't imagine going through what Lisa, my daughter Tiffany's mother, Lisa, has gone through losing Kepler to gun violence. It had a profound effect on my daughter, absolutely. Um, one of the problems with us is African Americans, we don't like to seek therapy. And the reason we don't is we think that other people are going to think we're crazy. That's one. But probably the biggest reason is we can't afford it. And it's not available to us like it's available to some other people. Uh, we can't just pick up and go to therapy like that. You know, we we got to keep the lights on and the heat going and, and all of that other stuff. We're not born usually into the kind of world for us that health care of that magnitude and that is health care mental health is health that mental health care is readily available that you can afford a therapist or, or a psychoanalyst or a psychologist or even a, or a psychiatrist we're usually not born in, into that kind of access wealth wise that it's easy for us to do it so some people choose one route, some people mourn in one way, some people grieve in one way, some people medicate themselves until they are, they are hooked, and they want to blame it on, well, when I was a young person, my father died, or my mother died, or my brother was killed, or my sister was killed. My dad used to always say that's the coward's way out. He said you use someone's passing to make yourself a better person, to make that person extremely proud of you. My dad also... Um, left me a book. It's a notebook. I have it to this day, and I have my dad's briefcase on the civil rights movement. And he used to cut clippings out of the newspapers um, while African Americans in this country were going through the civil rights. Do you fight for civil rights? And he would cut clippings out, and he left them all to scrapbook. The civil rights movement, there's poetry in there. It's, it's really some beautiful, beautiful stuff in this book that my dad left for me. And he left it to me, actually, and my brothers. And it's so old, my sister wasn't even born when my dad uh, put this scrapbook of the civil rights movement together. And my sister's in her 50s, so you know how old this book is. And I look at that book often. And I realized um, how smart it was for my father to make sure that that kind of stuff lived on. And I will definitely be leaving it to my son when I pass on. And um, how lucky I actually was to grow up with my dad in the house with me. As the generations moved on, there were a lot of people that did not grow up they either grew up you know their dad took care of them you know some in some cases mom ran off and dad held the family down or mom died early dad held the family down or later on dad got into the drug business or for whatever reason something happened to him in the streets and either he's locked up or he's not there anymore and those kind of things have a profound effect on who you are and, and how you grow up. And it's true. I mean, there's been hours and hours and hours and hours of research on this. And it really has a really big effect on who you are as a person. I mean, you can change, but it still has an effect on you. I mean, you can you can make it out. And there's a lot of people that do very well that came from single parent homes or single mother homes or whatever, they do extremely, extremely well. But a lot of times we weren't 
really born into privilege. Like, we're all privileged in one way or another, and I will get to that a little later on. We're all privileged in one way or another compared to other people. Uh, We are all privileged. But for African Americans in this country, it's a little bit, a little bit harder. It's a lot harder. And a lot of people, they don't believe that. Like, there's a lot of white people in this country. And what I'm about to say, if I have a lot of white listeners, it's going to rub you the wrong way. But I'm going to open this up and I'm going to teach you something um, today. A lot of white people have white privilege and they don't believe it. And that's not to say that it's your fault, but it is to say that you need to recognize it. I'm not telling you, oh, be ashamed. Oh, my God. Uh, Because it's not your fault. A lot of times it's not your fault, but you should be aware of the fact that white privilege exists. And you should be aware of when you hear minorities in this country talking about white privilege. You should be aware that white privilege exists. The same way when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening, you heard people start talking about white lives matter or the police came up with blue lives matter or, you know, other people from other ethnicities came up with whatever their their ethnicity was, their lives matter. But the reason why we came with Black Lives Matter is because their is a outlandish number of young black African Americans being killed by the police. Okay? You have that privilege that it doesn't happen to you on the scale that it happens to black people. And if you don't believe it, just look it up. Everything is Googleable. Uh, I don't know if that's a word, but it should be Google a bull because Google has made such an impact on our lives that if we don't know anything, we just say what? Google it. We don't say Yahoo it. We don't say whatever other kind of websites, the search engines there are. We say Google. Google is top of mind. First out your mouth. So Google a bull is almost like going to the library to research something like let's go research that. But you can. not That's another word for researching. Go research it and see if the number of young black people or black people, period, unarmed black people being killed by the police doesn't, isn't substantially higher than the number of white people that's being killed by police. So that's why we say black lives matter. That's why Colin Kaepernick took a knee. That's why we raise a fist. That's why we march because it happens to us. Not saying it doesn't happen to you, but it happens to us way more than it happens to you. I don't want to throw a number out there, but if I had to bet, I would say at least five to 10 times more than it happens to you. That is part of your white privilege. And people always take a negative connotation to white privilege. And I can understand a lot of black people being upset about white privilege, but a lot of people that have white privilege today is not their fault. They were born into white privilege. Here's an example of white privilege. If you don't think this is true, most white people can turn on the television, American white people, or open the front page of the newspaper and see people of their race widely represented. Why? And I've noticed this many, 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 many times before. And I stopped thinking about it because it angers me. And there's nothing I can do about it. And I don't want to be angry all the time. I don't want to take my anger out on white people that have nothing to do with that fact because it's the vast majority don't because the vast majority don't sit in those power positions to make those decisions but you can turn on the television or open up the front page of the paper and see your race widely represented now when i say widely represented this is what i mean the good and the bad the uh uh-uh and the wow the Accomplishment and the trying, widely represented. From every single walk of life, you are widely represented if you turn on the television 
or open a newspaper, if you still read the newspaper, widely represented. How are most black people represented in the newspaper? If you grab a newspaper, look at it and see. We're not as widely represented as, as white people are, and neither is any other ethnic, eth, ethnicity except white people. You could that's not privilege. It's not don't don't take this the wrong way, because I'm gonna get to that a little bit later on, but I'm telling you that it exists. And for a lot of people in this country, they just don't think it exists. They think that everything is even, the playing field is even. I worked hard, and if you work hard, you can achieve what I achieve also. To a certain degree, that may be true, but there's a lot of other factors that go into a lot of people's positions in this country. When you told or learned about national heritage or civilization, you are shown that people, white people, made it what it is in school, in college, on television, in movies. Whenever national heritage or civilization is talked about, white people are shown as the people who made it what it is, no matter what. It is always about, look how proud I am, what we did as white people. Nobody else helped us. We did it. If there is someone of, of a different ethnicity, it's often stereotypical, or it's often in a, in a lower... Um, you want to show your benevolence to them. So look what white people did. Look how we look how we saved the world. Look what we did for these black people. Look what we did for these Indian people. Look what we did for these Mexican or Latin people. Look what look what we did. We're the we're the great people. We we are the ones that made this world what it is. The, the, uh, this civilization or this national heritage. This is what we did. But you don't ever want to show the bad parts of what you did. You really don't want to have that conversation. You don't, you don't, you know, I've yet to really see a major movie about how you manipulated and stole the land from the Indian people. I, I just, I don't think that movie will ever be made. But it's true. But you want to pat yourself on the back. And you can do that because you're running stuff. That's white privilege. If a traffic cop pulls you over or the IRS orders your tax return, you can be absolutely sure that you haven't been singled out because of your race. Let that sink in for a minute. Because I know a lot of you, if you're white and you're thinking like, damn, I want to turn this podcast off because Ed is killing white people and he's blaming us. A lot of this is not your fault, but you need to recognize that it exists. So when somebody is talking about it, you're able to understand where they're coming from and maybe you're able to help. If a traffic cop pulls you over, police period, pull you over, or the IRS audits your tax returns, you're not being singled out because of your race. Think about it. That's the first thing I think about when I get pulled over by a cop, especially if I'm in a nice car in a lily white neighborhood. The first thing I think about is they pulling me over because of my race. First thing I think about. And nine times out of ten, I'm absolutely correct. Because they will come up with some of the most insane excuses for pulling us over or stopping us on the street that you have ever heard in your life. And this one always works for the police. If they run up on us and we just walking down the street, minding your own business. I used to live in West Orange, New Jersey, one of the most affluent neighborhoods in that area of New Jersey. Livingston, all of that, short hills, very, very, West Orange, very affluent, beautiful houses. My house was absolutely gorgeous. Jogging. Jogging. In my neighborhood, I was jogging. I lived there. I paid property taxes. I have a beautiful six-bedroom house. Jogging. Cops pull up on me, stop me, ask me for my ID, put me up against the car, and start frisking me because I'm a black man in a white neighborhood jogging. Here was their excuse. We had a robbery around here, and you fit the description. That's their motherfucking excuse all the time. Can I tell you something? 
if I had weed on me, if I had a gun on me, even if my gun was registered in my name, I would have been in a world of trouble. I would have had to loudly say that I have a weapon. I would have had to loudly say my carry permit is in my pocket. And it's still a strong possibility that I might have gotten shot. It really doesn't happen to you. It, it, it just doesn't. This is another example that I'm trying to give you of white privilege. White privilege. And you know who has the most white privilege? White males have more white privilege than white females. White males have more white privilege in this country than white females. So when we start talking about harassment by the police, when you're not doing anything at all, it's not always standing in front of a bodega. It's sometimes it's being next to your house. I've been questioned in my own driveway. In my own driveway by the police. That really doesn't happen to you. Think about this. If you want to, you can arrange to be in the company of people of your race most of the time. If you really want to, you can arrange to be in the company of people of your race most of the time. That even includes probably your job. You can arrange to be in the company of people of your color all the time. There are very few black people in the, in, that work for Intercom here in Chicago. Very few. Um, if I'm not mistaken, let me see if I can count. And I work for Intercom here in Chicago. Very few. Let me see. The ones that I know. Floyd, myself, Krista, Rose, and Gwen. Five. And this is whew, one two, three, five or six radio stations. I think it's five radio stations. It may be six. I may be leaving out a radio station. So maybe there's one per radio station. Oh, uh, Ryan that works uh, overnights. Yeah, Ryan works overnights board. So there may be, but I know it's less than 10. I'm, I'm going to put it to you like that because I don't see everybody because I work mornings, but I absolutely know that there's less than 10. So this is a huge company. So if think about less than 10, there are people that work there that can arrange to be in the company of people of their race most of the time. Most doesn't mean all, but most of the time, your privilege is you can arrange to be in the company of people of your race. Most of the time, you can dine with them, you can drink with them. There's places you can go where you live with them. You see them all of the time. There's not a single day that goes by that a black person doesn't have to deal with a white person in some way, shape, or form. Not a single day of your life. And it holds true for me. It holds true for my mom. It held true for my grandfather. It held true for my great-great-grandfather. We have to deal with you. You don't have to deal with us. Uh, Once again, to all of my white fans that are listening, I am not blaming you. I want you to be aware that this exists. If you are a person that denies white privilege, that no, it doesn't exist, I want you to be aware that it does exist. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not saying that you're in a position of power or that you created this. Maybe your forefathers did, but I'm not saying you in 2018 are the reason this exists. But I want you to know that it does exist. And I want white people in this country, especially white males, to stop denying the fact that you have white privilege. If you listen to what I'm saying, you can probably now get a big, a better picture of how white people and people of color, uh, we experience the world in a whole totally different ways. 
I don't want you to feel guilty about white privilege. It's not your fault that you were born with white skin and experienced these privileges. But if you realize it or you don't realize it, you do benefit from it. And it is your fault if you don't maintain awareness about it. It is absolutely your fault. Absolutely your fault. Think about this. If you want to, if where you live at now, if you want to move, you can be pretty sure that you're not going to have a problem renting or purchasing housing in a place where you can afford and where you want to live. Think about that. You know how many black people have had the money and the means and still couldn't get what they wanted? You are pretty sure, unless you're going into one of them super snooty buildings where they got to sit in front of the board and all that, but nine times out of ten, you're going to be pretty cool with renting or purchasing housing in the area where you can afford and where you want to live, where you want to live, not where you're forced to live, where you want to live. You also can be pretty sure that the people that are around you in your neighborhood we're going to be neutral to you a very, very pleasant. Pretty damn sure that's going to happen. You can go shopping wherever you want to most of the time by yourself. And you can be assured that you're not going to be followed or harassed. Pretty damn sure that that's not going to happen to you. You know, you know how much it happens to me? You know, let me give you a little example of how white privilege works. Macy's. I still shop in Macy's because I don't blame Macy's for what happened to me. I was at Macy's one time and uh, I'm standing online and I was going to pay for my purchase. There was a white woman in front of me who was standing at the register paying for her purchase. Her purchase was a couple of hundred dollars a couple probably in the range of three to five hundred dollars if I remember correctly the lady pulled out all hundred bills the middle aged white woman took her couple of hundred bill, hundred dollar bills put them in the drawer and gave the lady her change and said thank you for shopping at Macy's and have a nice day my purchase was in the 80 to $90 range. I pulled out one single $100 bill and handed it to the lady. And the lady took my $100 bill, held it up to the light, and took that pen that they used to mark counter to see if a bill is counterfeit and wiped it off the bill, looked at the bill again. When nothing came back that my bill was counterfeit, she took it and held it up to the light again. I immediately said, can I speak to a manager? And she said, what's the problem? And I said, you just racially discriminated against me. This is what happens to us on a constant basis. I got in an Uber not too long ago. A young white lady picked me up and she asked me, you know, they usually say, are you such and such? A? And I, you, you respond in kind, yeah, I am. And I got in the Uber and she said that. And then she said, where are you going? And then I told her. And then she asked me again. And I know that I put the address to where I was going <laughs> when you picked me up, so you should pretty much know where I'm going. Um, and she asked me twice where I was going, and I didn't really think nothing of it. And then I kind of like was looking at her like, why do you keep questioning me, asking me so many questions? Because usually Uber drivers don't do that. I've been in a lot of Ubers since I've been here working and living in Chicago. I Uber most of the time or Lyft most of the time because my cars are with my family. So, and it's too damn, it costs too much living downtown Chicago to put your car in a garage. A lot of these places want upwards of $200 a month just to park your car daily, like going in and out whenever you feel like it and, and having a car. I'm not even going to spend $200 or $250 a month on an Uber so or Lyft wherever I'm going. So, I prefer to not have a car here in Chicago. If I need a car, zip car works extremely well for me. I love it. So that's the way I get around. So she asked me all of these questions, and I was actually in an Uber pool 
It's a lot cheaper, and I don't mind. People don't usually talk to you in the Uber pool. Everybody's on their phone anyway. So she makes the next stop, and an Indian guy gets in the car. She didn't ask him his name. She didn't ask him where he was going. She didn't even ask him, was this the right person? Like, you know, Uber drivers usually want to make sure they picked up the right person. She did not ask this guy anything. He got in the car, and she just pulled off and, and and I was like saying to myself, fuck, she going to ask me, a black guy, a gang of questions, but this guy gets in the car and she doesn't even ask him anything. And I felt racially discriminated against and I brought it to Uber's attention and they took care of me nicely. Thank you, Uber, very much. And, and they also made sure that this young lady will never pick me up again, ever. And I was like, wow, did that just... Did that just happen to me? Wow. You can be pretty sure. Yeah, if you have the money, that you're going to get a loan if you walk into the bank. If you got the money and you got your collateral, you're going to get a loan. It's very tough. Even if we have the money to get a loan. It's very tough to move into a lily white neighborhood because you want and this is crazy that we have to think about this that when you become of means you move because you know the educational system is better for your kids that is cra- that's crazy to think about that that there is a disparity in the quality of education is so vast among minorities and not minorities that you think to li- that did you actually believe this and it is true that the higher the income of the community, the better the education. So I can't live with my people if I get money because your educational system is not, and I'll have kids, your educational system is not going to be what the educational system of a one town or two towns over that is 70 to 80 or maybe even 90% white has. And once again, I'm not saying this to blame you. I want you to be aware that it exists. So when you see, when you see things like Colin Kaepernick protesting police brutality, when you hear us talk white privilege, you understand that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have white privilege. And you don't and you don't deny it. If you don't maintain awareness of the fact that you're part of the problem. And when you hear somebody of African American heritage say white privilege and you say, nah, oh no, yeah, it's right now, we don't need affirmative action anymore. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. If you don't think that you have white privilege, please explain to me why there are more black people than white people in prison, in the prison system, but you're the majority of people. So you really think that we just do more crime than you do? Or do you believe that we will get more time where you'll get a slap on the wrist and told to go home? Or your parents get to come and get you and you don't go through the system at all where we end up in the system. You you really, really, in your heart of heart, believe that, then you really got to check yourself because there's really, really something wrong with you. If we, as African Americans, can admit that there is white privilege, why can't you admit that you have white privilege? We know it exists. We're not saying it's your fault. Man, you may be 38 years old or 30 seven years old or 27 or even 42, 43 years old. You wasn't even around when Jim Crow, you had no power. You had no power when we couldn't drink from the same fountain or use the same bathroom or even attend school with you. The level of education was better. We couldn't attend the same schools that you attended when you were getting a better education than we were. 
HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, were invented because we had to segregate ourselves away from you for a better chance at it. And the black scholars that were created in this country came back to teach the next generation of black people. That's what HBCUs were made for because we couldn't get into your Yales and your Harvards and your, and your Ivy League schools and your Stanfords and your Purdue's and, and even your Penn States and, and North Carolina states or Alabama's and all that. We couldn't go to those schools. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't allowed. It was law. It was law. You didn't want it. You were so afraid. Parents was marching outside of schools all the way in from Boston down to Alabama because they didn't want their kids going to school with Negroes or African Americans, niggas, spear chuckers. They don't have the mental capacity. They're animals. They're savages. They're going to ruin my, ch my child's chance at a decent education by sitting next to them and learning. This is law. So you don't think you had a leg up? You don't you you really believe that that you don't that you're not privileged? Some people really honestly believe that they're not privileged. Couldn't go to school. Did you know at one point at some a lot of places in America it was illegal for a black man and a white man, even if they were friends, to fish together? It was illegal for a white woman and a black man to fall in love and to marry and have children. It was illegal for a lot of things, simple things like that. Couldn't drink from the same fountain. Couldn't couldn't walk into a restaurant and sit down. Could not ride wherever you want to ride on the bus. Get in the back. That's where you belong. Yeah, you're free. Yeah, you're not a slave anymore. But there's ways around that. Lock you up for nothing. Make you a slave again. Oh, you jaywalking? No ticket. You're going to jail. Make up shit, plant guns on you. Cops are right? Nah. And they weren't really black cops or firefighters that used to ignore the fire signal in black neighborhoods. Just let that shit burn to the ground. We ain't going over there. Fuck them niggas. And you don't think that you have privilege? We had black banks and institutions, but every time we built something up, those mass riders would ride into town or they think those niggas think they uppity and burn all of our stuff down to the ground with no legal recourse. No legal recourse. This is why this kind of privilege exists. Because my grandfather was not given the opportunities to advance that your grandfather and grandmother were given. Not at all. Couldn't own a patent. Even if you invented something, you could not benefit off of it because you were African-American and the law stated that African-Americans could not own a patent. So the generational wealth that still exists in this country for a lot of people did not exist for us. My grandfather was a sharecropper. He could not hand money down to my mother and my mother handed down to me. And my, my father's dad was pretty... Or there was no money being handed down. There was no millions or hundred thousands of dollars being handed down to us from our grandparents and great grandparents and stuff like that. There was no automatic dad went to Harvard. You're going to Harvard. You know, that long list of alumni of 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 everyone going to the same colleges and universities and all of that. that man shit that didn't happen most of our parents didn't go to college they had children and a mortgage those of us that were able to get one and own a house do you know in my neighborhood I grew up in a neighborhood called Queens New York in New York City it's one of the five boroughs Queens is one of the boroughs I grew up on the north side of Jamaica Queens my wife grew up on the south side of Jamaica, Queens. When we first moved there, there was that was a white neighborhood. Um, I saw this documentary about when we started moving out of the inner city into the suburbs, which is Queens was considered. Um, one particular nice, nice area 
um, is Laurelton, Queens. It's very nice, very nice houses. When black people started moving into Laurelton, Queens, the white realis- realtors went and put flyers in the door of the white neighborhood, white neighbors, and told the white neighbors that black people were moving into your community, sell us your houses now, because while your property value is still good, because you know they're going to bring the property value down. And a lot of white people listen, and that became another flight for white people to move from Queens further out into Long Island, way out into Long Island, way out. Ah, and I live next to them. Don't know them. Don't know them from a can of paint. You just, you just so deathly afraid that you don't want to live. And and, and this is not you. It's, this may not be you. You might consider yourself liberal and forward thinking. You might even have some black friends. I love that term. I have black friends. I love that term. And some of you really do have black friends. I, I, you really do. Um, and some of you have black people that you know. You like you, you associate with them, but they're not really your friends. Like they're not at family gatherings, and when your kid get christened and all that, and your best black friend, and who shouldn't even be, you know, have to wear that title of your black friend. He should just be your friend, you know. Um, a lot of you do. So I'm not. I'm not really saying. Again, that this is your fault, but I want you to be aware of white privilege and the fact that you do have it, and especially white men, more so than any other people. White men have white privilege, and they're trying to hold on to it, and they know it exists. The powers that be that are in Washington, D.C. right now know that white male privilege is the dominant thing in this country and they want to hold on to it as much as they can. They are not about the rights of anybody else but themselves, not even white women. And they love it so much that you just fall in line with whatever they want to tell you and they want to force you to have an abortion even if you don't want to and you fall in line and you march for it because you think biblically is what you're supposed to do. And morally, this is what you're supposed to do if you're conservative. Uh, white woman is the right to life, and the, but a woman has the right to choose. That's the bottom line. They want to take your right to choose away from you, too. In some cases, even if you were raped. Even if you were raped. They want to take the right away from you to choose. Yeah, this is serious business. They want to, con- they really want to control you, control you. But what we also have to understand, and this is something that I've come to learn, there's a different kind of privilege. And we have the privilege of citizenship. So simply being born affords us certain privileges that non-citizens will never access. It's very true. Class, there's class privilege. Being born into a, a certain financial level can pretty much help guarantee your health, happiness, safety, education, intelligence, and future opportunities unless you squander them. But they're there for you, right? Class privilege, there's class privilege sexual orientation privilege. Now, if you're born straight, pretty much every state in the country affords you more privilege than non-straight folks have, and they got to fight the Supreme Court for. That's true. Sexual privileges, if you're born a male, you pretty much can assume, and I can assume this all the time, and, and black, white, I don't care what you are, you know you probably can walk through a parking garage without having to worry about being raped and then have to deal with a defense attorney that's going to tell you it's because of what you were wearing. You pretty much know sexual privilege. Ability. Privilege for being born able-bodied. You ain't really got to plan your life around handicap, whether or not there's handicap access or braille. We don't even think about that. Or other special needs. And 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 listen to this. I just I, I looked this up. 
And I got a lot of these facts from this article, all right, that was written, I'm going to tell you who it was written by, by Gina Crossley Cochran. She was born a broke-ass white girl living in a trailer park, and she had some very fascinating points, and I'm going to share some of these points with you. If you were born what they call cisgender, that is your gender identity matches the sex that you are assigned with at birth, you really don't have to worry that using a restroom or locker room will invoke public outrage. So you can see right there that we're all born with some kind of privilege, some kind of privilege. But I don't want you to take this the wrong way and think, oh, my God, Ed is jumping down our throat. I want you to just acknowledge it. I acknowledge that I was born with the privilege of being cisgender. I was born with the privilege of having two parents in my household. I was born with the privilege of being a male. I don't have to explain why I was wearing a dress with no drawers under it. If somebody jumps on me and, do, and does something to me, it's not going to be considered my fault. I am a a middle-class black American who was born not rich, but not exactly dirt-ass poor. I mean, we were poor until my parents got it together and moved us out to Queens, but we had a house, and there was a car in front of it, and at one point there was two cars in front of the house, my mother's car and my father's car. And I went to pretty decent schools, and until my dad died, I had an opportunity to go straight from high school to college but like I told you my dad died when I was 18 my brothers opted to go to civil service one became a police officer and the other one went into the armed forces but I had that 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 opportunity my brother went to the armed forces and went to college and became an accountant through the armed forces I had the opportunity to go to school your own TV raps came and I was like, hey, I'm going to do this. And then radio came and then books and then television and then movies. And my career that has spanned 30 years plus has always kept me going. And sometimes I really do consider going back and getting my degree. But I had that opportunity. That was a privilege because my parents worked hard to put us in a position like that. We weren't born with that. That was not a given for us. It really wasn't. It really wasn't like just this is something that that you were born into. So once again, I say this because I I have encountered in my career a lot of people of different ethnicities that have been wholeheartedly wonderful people. Wholeheartedly wonderful people. And I've also encountered some people that try to act like they're wonderful people but they're not wonderful people. You know, the spectrum is vast for me. And there are great, great supportive people that were white for me in my career. And there was not so great white people for me in my career. There have been many, many white friends. Some of them I just ran into recently, a Lollapalooza, Doug Herzog and the crew that were really instrumental in, in my career. Ted Demi, Peter Doherty, you know what I mean? At, 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 um, you know, I know he's going through this thing with Dame Dash, but Leo Cohen helped me out a lot in my career. There's been some black people that I thought were my friends that were snakes. I'm not even going to mention them. They're not even worth me mentioning. My whole point is to say again, I want white people that listen to this podcast to know that white privilege exists and not to deny it. Do not say, no, that's not true. This is America. Childish Gambino said it best. This is America. You were born, most of you, into white privilege. Accept it. It's not your fault and understand it. But don't deny it. When you see something going on, don't get deny it or get mad go, oh, no, that's not true. Everybody can everybody can be on an even level. No, no, we can't. No, we can't. There's a lot of civil service jobs that when my parents were young, growing up in the Jim Crow era, they couldn't even become firefighters or 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 lawyers or or freaking policemen 
or electrical engineers and none of that, none of that stuff. We wasn't getting hired. Bank managers, we're not getting hired. Why are we still dealing with firsts in this country for black people? That's ridiculous. Why aren't there any black NFL owners? They got the money. Don't tell me that you can't put a group together and get the money. Why? Because, but once you get the money, the other white boys that control it, the owners have to vote whether or not they're going to allow you, allow you to buy that team, allow you to buy that team. Why aren't there as many black young black people in the tech world as white people, and especially white males. We don't go to school for it. Don't believe the hype. We're not interested in it. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. We don't get hired. I know some brilliant tech dudes. Brilliant. Can't even get a job. Where their white counterparts are getting a job. That's why affirmative action is important because historically you had to force people to hire people of color to hire any minority period that wasn't lily white from the police department to the fire department to even moving up once you got that job even moving up why are we still lauding first like oh Beyonce is the first on the cover and the centerfold of Vogue how long has Vogue magazine been out you mean to tell me we have never been worthy of being in the, on the cover or the centerfold of Vogue. No black person has ever been fantastic enough in the fucking eyes of white people. That's the problem. Why are we still, we should not be celebrating first for any minority in this country as old as this country is. That shit shouldn't exist anymore. It should not, shouldn't be the first black person to own a football team, a professional football team. If I have the means and the way, so if I, so the shit that you've been handing me about, if I work hard, I could be anything that I want to be. So you will stand there and firmly believe, even if you did not like him, that Barack Obama was the first qualified black person to be the president of the United States. Look at the country. You don't think white male privilege more than any other gender exists? Why haven't we had a white woman president? Stop denying this shit. That's all I'm saying. I'm not blaming you, but I, I, I'm mad for the ones that, at the ones, excuse me, that deny that this exists. It exists. If it didn't exist, and especially with the white male population, if that did not exist, if white male privilege did not exist, Donald J. Trump would not be the president of the United States because he's not qualified. How come qualified black people can't get a position that a not qualified white male can get? I rest my case on that. My name is Ed Lover. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Spread the word. It's called Come On Son, the podcast. It's on Apple. It's on SoundCloud. It's free. You can get it. Once again, to all the white people that listen to my podcast, I'm not blaming you. You're not, a lot of y'all ain't old enough to even be in a position of power where you can be blamed for white privilege. But recognize that it exists and recognize that you're a beneficiary of white privilege the same way I'm a beneficiary of straight American privilege, able bodied privilege. I am, and I know it. I'm, I'm, I have financial privilege. Because there's a lot of places that I lived that <laughs> even poor white people couldn't live. A lot of shit that I drove or flew. Or, yeah. And I have celebrity privilege. I get in places and get better tables because I'm a celebrity. In some people's eyes, some people's eyes not. Some people's eyes, yes. So thank you for listening to this podcast. Come on, son, the podcast. Y'all keep God first. Everything else will fall into place. I'll talk at you, with you, to you, and about you next week. Be good if you can't be good. Be careful. Can't be careful. Name your baby something that will ensure them of getting a job when they get older. To the next time we ride together, slide together, laugh out loud together. Ed Lover, Krista Hayes, Kimana Paulus, saying God bless. And, of course, the angel of Combat Jack. 
saying God bless each and every one of y'all. Thank y'all for tuning us in and never tuning me out. I give you the good shit, never the bullshit. Come on, son. Now get the fuck out of here with that bullshit you talking. This episode of Come On, Son, the podcast is produced and engineered by co-executive producers Kimana Paulus and Krista Hayes. Recorded at Mean Street Studios in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, this is an official Loudspeakers Network podcast.